Welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with your host, Dr. Nick Vanterhaven, and brought to you by ECG Management Consultants. You can learn more about the show on the program's page at healthcarenowradio.com or on our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud. The U.S. spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country on the planet. So why don't we have superior outcomes? Why haven't the principles of capitalism prevailed? And why do American consumers have so much trouble accessing and paying for healthcare? Each week, Healthcare Upside Down will dive into these and other issues with ECG principal, Dr. Nick, and guest panelists as they discuss the upsides and downsides of healthcare in the US and how to make the system work for everyone. And we end with your better pill to swallow, the conclusion to today's episode with insights on challenges and changes that improve healthcare. Now here's your host, Dr. Nick. According to the Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform, more than 800 rural hospitals are at immediate or at high risk of closure. Almost every state has at least one rural hospital at risk of closure, and in one state, all their rural hospitals are at risk of closing. For those living in close proximity to medical services, this may seem part of the normal life cycle of businesses, but the impact on these communities is significant. In many cases, the healthcare system is often the biggest employer, and certainly in the top three employers, so losing the system creates even more downward pressure on the community's survival. The health system is not only critical to the local economy, but it is quite often an anchor tenant, to use the vernacular of malls. With health services, not only is the local economy devastated, but the ability to attract new businesses or create an attractive living environment is greatly diminished. For any employer, they need employees. But employees that don't have local health services to support them and their family will be inhibited from moving to these communities. Ideally, residents should be able to conveniently and confidently access services such as primary care, dental care, behavioural health, emergency care and public health services. When these are tens and sometimes hundreds of miles away, the local population suffers and the communities fade. These communities are already struggling with a disproportionate amount of mental health issues, substance abuse and chronic disease burdens and higher mortality and morbidity. If that were not enough of an impetus to focus on finding solutions, this negative impact is like a stone cast into the middle of a pond with ripples emanating outwards and impacting all of the surrounding areas. More pressure is felt in the surrounding healthcare systems already struggling and unable to cope. And these residents, already in poorer health and struggling with inequity, seek care in these surrounding areas. And to be clear, that's only for those fortunate enough to be able to access remote care, able to travel, and with sufficient means or support to make the journey to these remote facilities. Emergency services are further strained and end up resource limited as they must transport patients longer distances, tying up these resources for extended periods of time. So it may be easy to see this as someone else's problem, but ultimately this impacts us all, and we are all vested in creating a successful and sustainable, even vibrant rural healthcare system that must be an integral part of the healthcare delivery everywhere. Join me on the Healthcare Upside Down show as I talk with Angela Amon. She is the Chief Executive Officer for Clinch Memorial, a critical access rural hospital located in Southeast Georgia. Angela is a nurse by trade and a healthcare problem solver who took on the challenge of rural healthcare that remains challenged by geography and a host of other economic drivers that creates headwinds that for many can be difficult to navigate and overcome. Hi, Angela, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. So you work in a rural setting. How do you define success for uh, an organization like that? Well, I think that would vary greatly from uh, the season that you're in and from the person who is actually the CEO of the hospital, because I think how I define success the first year I was CEO is much different 
than how I define it now. I think everyone would agree with me, my peers, that success for us is just surviving another wave of COVID and being able to keep our doors open. And, you know, the first year that I was CEO, it was uh, defined as, who we have another year that we could keep the doors open and I was able to make payroll consistently. And then uh, success changes, whether I'm pursuing another degree or whether a service line was implemented and it's successful. Uh, but this year is definitely being able to fight this virus, the novel virus that keeps coming in waves and uh, to navigate the reimbursement and utilize the resources that are given us and stay open and keep 150 plus employees open. So that's how I am defining success this year. So you're in a community, you're remote from many of the support infrastructure. It generates a series of economic challenges. Sure. Um, and you've managed to navigate this successfully and, you know, through your definition and recognize that mm -hmm. definition changes over time to be successful, even through COVID, which, you know, for some places has been, I, I think, a, a, an even bigger burden that maybe some will not be able to sustain against. What has contributed? How have you managed that? What's, what are the key elements that bring you to a successful outcome? I think being successful thus far, uh, it really has a lot of elements to it. First, I think uh, making sure that we don't put all of our eggs in one basket, per se. Uh, the, we implemented a swing bed program almost four years ago that focused on caring for people who really were not inside of our demographic area of uh, reach or uh, where we would normally care for and that we pull from a couple of different states and even from North Atlanta. And we provided care for bent trait patients. Little did we know that preparation would set us up for success to battle a novel virus that attacks the respiratory system and places tons of people on ventilators. And so we did not know. And there was several reasons that we were more successful and we were, have been able to weather a little bit better because of our increase, our, our usage of Medicare set us up for a larger uh, Medicare advanced payment um, bail out to help us um, during that first wave. Our nursing staff and respiratory staff are used to taking care of vented patients. And so as our chief medical officer, and you know, we were faced with a lot of things, not having an ICU, we had to set up an emergency ICU and so forth. But I think the success of the VENT program, the recognition that we got from uh, legislation and politicians and press for that helped us be at the front when we needed help and we asked for it. So I used to be this huge introvert and I really am. I mean, there's, I, my favorite thing to do is just go home and shut down and read a book and, you know, with my dog, that's the way, the way I re-energize. And I really had to get out of that comfort zone of just being, just go home, don't network, don't go to these conferences. Uh, Cause it was just really, really made me very uncomfortable. But I, I realized that I had to do that. I had to do it for Clinch Memorial Hospital. I had to get her name out there. When I picked up the phone and asked for help, I wanted people to know who Angela Ammons was and who Clinch Memorial Hospital was. So all of that work on the front end has continued to set us up for success. And it's been hard to win the community over. Uh, we are rural, so we have a very low uh, college degree rate, uh, high illiteracy rate, high poverty rate. So basic understanding of medical services, that they're not free, that we're not a free clinic, that we do actually have to pay for COVID tests and other tests, even though you want a dozen a week that costs something, that's hard, compounded with the indigent population and the amount of money that we never get paid for, really was a stack against us from being successful. But I started reaching out, asking for grant funding, um, and we received two large grants, rural stabilization grants that really helped us. We were able to secure some red leg loans. And I don't think that would have happened in red leg. I can't tell you what exactly it stands for, but it was zero interest money that was over a million dollars. Could we have gotten that the first year I was here? Absolutely not. But all the hard work and everything that we had done to make our swing bed program successful led us to that. So I just want to encourage anybody who's listening. Sometimes you think these little things are not important or 
they don't have an immediate cash flow, you're, you're preparing and you're investing for the future for recognition. So um, it's not difficult for me to pick up the phone and call our local politician or our federal congressman now and say, I need help with this because they know who I am. I've invited them to my hospital. I've written a grant. Uh, they mentioned me or something in a newspaper article or I gave them credit for something. So I think the successes that we've had has been a group effort of my staff just getting on board. It was very difficult when I first got here. We had a, there was a huge culture change that needed to take place because they're like, please come in, save our hospital, but don't let it personally affect us. And you and I both know that that can happen. So there was a, there was a huge group effort, definitely for the people wanting to see this hospital survive. So I, I, I've heard that in, in other instances, you know, try everything, lots of success, but that has to mean that you've got a bunch of failure sitting behind you Absolutely. Um, and experiences, I, you know, has that been a waste of your resources, waste of your time, your staff? I mean, what's been, what's been your experience? Well, um, there are failures and I think a failure can be seen both ways as a true failure and you feel defeated or it's just a step closer to another success. So I've tried calculated risk that I knew were not going to cost the hospital a lot of money. There are some decisions that I had to make that I knew that I would take the brunt of the negative criticism and that's fine with me. I can take it all day long. Uh, I've had to make decisions in the community that they did not understand and if there are other leaders listening on this call, I think I'm in the middle of a, a closed Facebook group, at least every quarter that I need to be removed or, I, you know, what am I doing? She um, fired somebody who had been here for 30 years. Uh, you know, it's a really good person. And there are great people in this community, but maybe they're not perfect for the job that we need them to do here. So um, and a high performer, and I'm sure you're a high performer it's hard for us to accept failure because we want so badly for everything that we attempt to be great at it, to be phenomenal at it. And then we just do it and do it and do it until we're almost, we almost have it perfected. And then when you start a new service line or when you come up with a new idea, sometimes you don't have the chance to do that. You give yourself a year, if it doesn't work, then it's over. So um, I think that is very hard for high performers to accept, but I've learned in this game, it's just something that you just have to accept. So, so it feels like there's a part of this that has to be thick skin, the, the ability yeah. to resist some of that inbound. Um, you know, you come with a positive and a negative. You're a nurse. Mm -hmm. The positive is that gives you insight, um, you know, or deep clinical experience. But at the same time, one of the things that's built into the clinical um, protocol is you can't fail. F failure is seen as a, a, a negative to the outcome. So you're balancing that. Tell us a little bit about your experience of, you know, bringing your clinical background and how important that is. I, I think it's important. For me, it was important because when I first got here, I think there's a history of CEOs who try to do their best, but they did not have the medical background. They lack the understanding, even for compliance and CMS and, when I brought it to the board, we really need to be accredited. No one understood the importance of that. And so I think that brought in a perspective that was much needed. And it's a great, it's a state that inspects us, but how about us being joint commission accredited or DMV accredited? That, I mean, that helps us rank among our peers. And with nursing staff and the chief nursing officer, you know, there are a lot of complaints. Oh, we're short staffed. We don't have enough help. And I would say, okay, give me your numbers. I'm like, oh no, we're not short staffed. I have been the only nurse for you know a, a, a 15 bed psych unit before. This is not short staffed. We're just busier than normal. Let's just regroup and let's just talk about what we need to do here. Budgeting, knowing that there are grants out there that can help us. And if needed to be, I can jump in and help when we're really short staff. And I don't think the staff likes it when I do that. Sometimes they're very appreciative. And sometimes if I know there is an issue on the floor, I show up that shift report and say, okay, let's just see what's going on. I'm going to shadow you today. I'm going to shadow you. I heard there's some complaints. Let me see if I can help out. Usually there's no issues after that for several months, but 
for instance, we really needed to do testing in the community and we needed to do vaccines. We were short staffed, put on my scrubs and I manned the vaccine clinic with other staff. I went into the field and did testing. We had a code last week in the ER. And even though I'm not functioning as a nurse, I was able to be the extra set of eagle eyes. Is someone recording, you know, make sure we've got the epi in and so forth. So I think that helps a lot. And we have done very well on our application for accreditation. We got the first time around and we've had no, very minimal violations afterwards because as a nurse who's gone through several joint commission accreditations and being on that side, I tell the staff, okay, we need to check the refrigerator laws. We need to make sure there are no expired products. You know, in med staff, I'm able to understand the lingo that the physicians are throwing out and so forth. So I think that really has helped me be better prepared for taking on this role. So you, you talked a little bit about swing beds uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, that pivot that allowed you to uh, bring in uh, both the patients and also prep you for uh, the pandemic with a set of skills that, you know, maybe you didn't have in large supply. But what that means is you're transporting patients from their home area and they're coming to somewhere that's distant. How are you managing that? That feels like that's a, 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 a less form of care for those patients. Well, um, my job is to make sure our hospital stays open, that we have an ER for any urgent issues or trauma issues, and that we have ancillary services. And we had an average daily census of 1.8 in a 25-bed hospital from our own community. There's no way that we can sustain any operations with that. So I had to figure out a way to fill our beds up, keep enough beds open for the community so that when someone needed our ER, so that when we needed a vaccine clinic, we were here. Now, the community didn't understand it. And of course, you know, rumors started flying all over because they just lacked understanding. And why are you filling beds up with people who aren't from here? Well, they're not completely filled, but this is generating millions of dollars of revenue to employ people in our community and to keep that ER open. So I think sometimes people imagine or they envision the things the way things sh they think should be and their thought is reality for them so i knew it was going to be very difficult i mean literally i walked in the doors and we had 1.82 patients and nurses were twiddling their thumbs I'm like this is not why we got a nursing school so i knew something had to be done and it was very difficult we had to have huge upfront purchases of ventilators hiring respiratory therapists Finding an employed physician, we didn't even have a uh, physician on staff. They're all community physicians. Uh, policies and procedures that had to be created. Uh, all of these extra things that had to be done, but I knew the payoff would be later. And I think our first year of swing bed revenue off the start of here was $730,000. And within nine months of implementing this new program, it was over $5.2 million in Medicare revenue, which afforded us to hire staff uh, buy tons of capital equipment and continue to do that. But it's extremely difficult and it's nerve wracking. And I remember the second patient that we ever got in uh, had a plug or something and they were failing so fast. And I saw my professional career <laughs> go right before my eyes because I stepped on a limb, told the board we could do this. Because what happens usually when a patient stops breathing? You intubate them, right? These are already intubated. So what more can you do? So I was down there, and I think I was in a business suit that day. My chief nursing officer and my nurse educator were down there. That our, the physician that was on staff in the ER the day was panicking. I said, just get out. And we, you know, I said, you're not helping the situation any better. And I took turns bagging this patient. And the chief nursing officer, remember, we were all doing everything we could. And finally, I guess a plug um, must have broken loose or whatever, and the patient stats came up. But it is very scary in those situations to do that. And we look back and we laugh about it and we go, oh my gosh, we are crazy to even do it. But it really did help us be successful now for that. And it's very difficult. And a lot of people are probably going to shoot me or say, I can't believe you're saying that, that, but I don't think every rural hospital needs to be open, not in the fashion or format that currently sits in, because if there's a rural hospital and 20 miles away, there are four other hospitals. You're all trying to do the same thing. There's no way you can be successful. So what rural hospitals need to do is to 
take a step back and say, okay, what is the one thing that I can do well that these other large tertiary facilities don't want to do? And can I get that business? And right now in the state of Georgia, mental health is a population and that diagnosis is something that's hugely underserved. We don't have enough uh, state beds for mental health issues and so forth. So what if rural hospitals, if we just took a step back and said, let's redesign who we are and we keep an ER open and we have radiology and so forth, can we convert some of these beds to mental health beds? And you can stay open, but it's gonna take um, a lot of work and grants and so forth to make that happen, but it's possible and rural hospitals can stay open. So I, don't, I think that was probably a, a round the way to answer your question about that. No, that. That's absolutely right. And I think the central tenet there is conviction. And as you rightly point out, the staff need the experience because if you stop practicing and doing the work, you stop being good at it. Reminds mm -hmm. me a lot of a hospital that we opened, you know, that was rejected by the local community. It was, you know, stealing of resources and, you know, ultimately it brought so much more to the community. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, you, you've clearly managed to navigate it. It sounds like there are, uh, th there's no single answer and that answer doesn't persist. I think it's, you know, yes. constant changing. Um, as you think about the future, where do you see that going and, and why is it that you love it? I love the people I work with. I love coming in every single day and um, I'm a person who gets bored easily. So every day I have challenges that need to present themselves. And I have loved to see the people grow that are employed here professionally and personally from us taking on these projects. I'm just hoping that we could get some more financial support from the federal and state governments uh, for this COVID war that we're fighting because the initial payouts were almost two years ago and we still have another wave coming through. Um, I think success from this point on is continuing to stay open and providing care to the community. And I'm fine if we just break even every month. If we keep 150 people employed, I can pay the bills and we can take care of our community the best way that we can, I'm happy. I'm successful. And, and the one thing that you feel throughout all of this that has managed to keep you grounded and centered, is that, is it the community? Is it your... Um, ability to jump in and understand that? Is it the thick skin? What, what, what do you think is the key element that you bring to this that really made the difference? Resilience. I think a lot of people would have packed up their little briefcase and left if they had been faced with some of the challenges that I had been faced with. But my entire life has set me up to weather about any storm that anybody else could not weather. So I think that's it. I mean, whether it's a, a harsh critic or a failure or uh, being without something, I've weathered all that. So I'm just like one of those carnival dolls that you throw a ball at and bounces back up. I, I really think that has been the true key to my success here is just being very, very resilient. So I, I it's clear that resilience, um, the capacity to really understand, get deep into the weeds, I think is mm -hmm. um, critical to success. And I don't think it's just rural hospitals. I think it's throughout the healthcare system. And importantly, the ability to see past where you are, because here you are, you've solved a problem, you kept it open, but you, I already hear as part of this, um, new futures, new opportunities, and specifically answering the question for the community that you sit in. So thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Diversification was critical to developing the resilience and came from a willingness to try different approaches to problems. In rural healthcare, success can be measured day to day, week to week, just making payroll as a key employer in the area for 150 people was a milestone early on. In the rural healthcare setting, stability and certainty can be hard to find, which provoked a culture of refusing to accept the status quo, setting the facility, and more importantly the staff, up for success 
especially in the uncertain times that arrived as a result of a novel pandemic-inducing virus. While change may not always be as dramatic, change is inevitable, and targets, goals, and the business environment continue to change no matter your industry or location. With a keen eye to detail that stemmed from real-world clinical experience, Angela was able to bring solutions that created revenue for the facility and turning around a critical access hospital in rural South Georgia. Your better pill to swallow is to develop your resilience and leave no stone unturned when seeking solutions and refusing to accept the current status quo, even when things are going really well. The pages of history are littered with companies and people who are not adaptable, believing that their position was immutable. Be bold, make decisions, accept the criticism, and be prepared to make changes as you learn from your inevitable mistakes and missteps. Thanks for joining me, your host, Dr. Nick, on this week's edition of Healthcare Upside Down. Until next week, keep solving the business of healthcare as if your life depended on it as one day soon, it will. That's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite listening platform by searching for Healthcare Now Radio. Also, check out our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud for summaries and commentary from each episode. Follow our show's social hashtag, HCUpsideDown. And join us each week as we work to solve the business of healthcare for everyone.